Thank you very much for asking me to come and uh, give you a little bit of an update today. Uh, I'm one of the oncologists working out of the City Hospital in Nottingham, which is um, the East Midlands host trust for the sarcoma patients and, of course, just as part of the sarcoma family. Um, so I've been asked to talk to you a little bit about current learning and development in gastrointestinal stromal tumours, and I thought what I would do is I will talk to you a little bit about the pathology, the epidemiology, and the presentation of GISTs. And then I'm going to take you through a GIST journey, in a way, starting from patients who have resected GIST, so um, patients where the GIST can be cut out, to patients where the GISTs can't be cut out. Uh, then at the end, we'd like to talk a little bit about trials. And I've put in little slides about what I sometimes struggle with, and that is when patients don't know what to ask. And it's so difficult to know what to ask. So I've put in some little pointers about what might be helpful. Um, I'm going to stay after the talk a little bit, so if there are any questions, then I'd be happy uh, to take them either here in the room or, or a little bit later. And if there's anything that you don't understand, I'm, of course, very happy for you to interrupt me and, uh, and ask. So what is GIST? Um, this doesn't come across very well. Um, it's a swirly kind of tumour. And what I'd like to point out before I go any further is that today I'm not going to talk about microgists. Microgists are common, they are small, and they are not malignant. So they don't spread as far as we know. And there are genetic changes that have to happen for a microgist to possibly become a real gist um, or a malignant gist. So I'm not going to talk about these, but they are found quite often. So if patients have a bit of bowel taken out for other reasons, you can have a little gist in there, and that can cause a bit of anxiety, but that's really not what we're talking about today. So what is a gist? Well, a gist originates in the bowel, and the bowel, I'm talking here from the gullet all the way down to the bottom. It can occur in other structures, and again, that can be sometimes quite confusing. So there is the scaffolding that holds the bowel, and supplies the bowel with, with blood and takes away the nutrition. Um, it has the blood vessels in it, etc. You can get gist in there. The omentum is like an apron that covers the bowel, and uh, you can have gist originate in there. The back of the tummy, called the retroperitoneum, can have gist. And then in females, between the rectum and the vagina, there's a, a space there, and very occasionally you can have a gist in there. And that can be quite difficult to manage. And then very rarely, and I've never seen one myself, is the abdominal wall. And there are connections during, obviously, embryonal development, where we're attached to our mother by the umbilical cord. So there are ways um, how these cells can get there. GISTs are to considered to be a sarcoma. And that can be quite confusing sometimes, because the majority of sarcomas don't originate in the bowel. And therefore, in different places, different teams look after GIST patients. And again, that can be quite confusing. Mm -hmm. So there are in, in Nottingham, the sarcoma team looks after the GIST patients. In Leicester, it's the bowel cancer team that looks after GIST patients. At the end of the day, I don't think it matters who looks after the patient as long as they have a practice and have lots of experience. We'll come back to that. The cells of origin, we always want to know where do these gists start, um, are, have been described and are thought to be uh, the interstitial cells of Cajal, who's a Spanish pathologist as far as I'm aware. And they are half muscle, half nerve, and they link the nervous system that controls bowel function, heart rate, etc., with the bowel, and that promotes motility. GIST cells often express receptors. Not all of them, 
um, and these receptors have mutations, and these mutations we can identify in the pathology lab. Now, I thought Philippe Tanier was coming today, so I've not put a huge amount in about the mutations, uh, but obviously the mutations are becoming, I think, increasingly important, so I'll try and uh, buffer that out just a little bit. The most common receptor that we find is the CKIT receptor, also known as CD117. That's just a different name, it's like um, for the drugs, you have two names for the drugs, the actual drug name and the um, trade name. So for lots of things in medicine, you have two names. I'm not quite sure why they do that. It's just to make it more complicated for everyone, I think, sometimes. Um, I'll come back to these receptors um, a bit later on in my talk because they are quite important because they drive what happens in a GIST. There are some other markers. Um, the DOG1. DOG stands for Detected on GIST. There you go. Nothing to do with dogs, <laughs> um, et cetera, um, that the pathologists look for. And as mentioned before, the mutation analysis is now, in my opinion, indispensable in virtually all cases of GIST. So these triangular cells, they connect to the muscle cells. And in the laboratory, you can see how the muscle cells start to contract when these cells are activated. So, what about the epidemiology then? It's very interesting that the incidence of GIST increased the moment there was a drug to treat it. GISTs quite often used to be classified as something called a leiomyosarcoma of the bowel. And they had a terrible prognosis. And before imatinib, the drug that we're going to talk quite a bit about later, came about in Scotland, they only identified about five cases per million per year that they identified as GIST because the pathologists weren't really looking for that and the patients had a terrible prognosis, so it was very easy to just say, this is a sarcoma, we're not interested in the subtype of the sarcoma because we can't do much about it anyway. After imatinib, or Gleevec, came along, suddenly oncologists like me said to the pathologist, hang on a minute, I want to know what this is because I can potentially treat that. And the pathologist started to develop techniques to identify GISTs, and the incidence rose, and it more than doubled. The incident now that we have drugs to treat is around 11 or 12 cases per million per year. And in Europe, that is roughly the rate that you have um, across the continent. It is most common in the seventh decade, but it can occur much in, in, in children and young adults. This is, called, is part of the pediatric gist and the pause gist. I'm not going to talk much about that today because I think you've got um, some more talk about that um, later on. Um, men and women are equally affected. It occurs mainly in the stomach, but you can, as mentioned before, have it in other parts of the bowel or indeed outside of the bowel. And the common presentation is bleeding, but not bleeding that you would necessarily notice. So you might find that your stools go dark, you might find actually that you don't know at all that you're bleeding, but suddenly you feel a bit more short of breath. Suddenly you feel tired, or when you stand up you feel a bit dizzy, and those are the symptoms of anemia. So some patients are found to be anemic, and it is only the anemia that points to a uh, more serious underlying problem. Patients can have pain, the abdomen can be distended, occasionally we have patients who present with bowel obstruction, and occasionally patients have an enlarged liver, because obviously that is one of the areas where the gist can spread to. <coughs> 
The investigations are usually fairly straightforward. It is an endoscopy, so a camera investigation. Um, quite often, it is the top one that finds the diagnosis. Occasionally, you do the top one, and then you do the bottom one. And very rarely, neither of those finds it. And then um, you need to have uh, more detailed investigations. Sometimes the only way to diagnose a GIST is to actually operate on the patient and take it out. If we can, we quite often like to have a biopsy first, especially in patients where an operation up front perhaps isn't the best idea because the surgeon tells us we need to take a huge chunk of bowel. Can you not please shrink it down for us a little bit? But we want to then have proof that we are dealing with a GIST. And of course, the CT scan of chest, abdomen and pelvis is a must because we want to know um, about the spread. So when I see patients at this stage, or when the surgeons see patients at this stage, the most important question is, what is it? And the surgeon should look at the report and say, I've got the report from the pathologist, it is definitely a GIST, and it is a GIST because it has got the right markers and it has got the right look to it. The next big question is, of course, is where is it? And there is a big difference between a GIST that is localized to part of the bowel or a GIST that has already spread to other organs. <coughs> and then finally, and this is probably the most important question, is who treats it? Because you want to have someone who's got experience, who's been trained in it. And that goes for the surgeon as much as it goes for the pathologist, the radiologist, very important, um, and also, of course, people like me that uh, provide drug treatment. When surgeon excise the gist, again, I'm sorry these pictures don't come across very well, but it's usually a quite well-defined tumour. And unlike with other sarcomas, where you take huge margins because the sarcoma can spread along very sort of fine tracks, with the gists, you don't have to take big margins. Occasionally, as I mentioned before, the surgeons come to us and say, can you downstage it? So can you give drug treatment and make it a bit smaller? Um, because that will make my surgery a little bit easier. And we, we, we do that uh, on a relatively regular basis now. So once the gist has been cut out, the question is again, is it truly a gist? Sometimes the biopsy can be misleading. So the actual resection specimen needs to be looked at very carefully. And where was it? And I'll come back to that in a minute, because the where is very important. The next question is, is, has it been completely cut out? And again, that is a question for the pathologist. If it hasn't been completely cut out, then the whole team needs to think again about what to do next. And the question goes then to the surgeon. Can you take out a bit more? Or is there a particular reason why you couldn't take it all out? And it is only the pathologist who looks at the microscope who can tell you whether the gist has been completely resected. And then the next big question is, if it has been cut out, what is my risk of it coming back? It can be quite difficult to know which gist is going to come back. So there have been uh, very careful studies looking at this and trying to figure out a way to define risk. They have come up with a few pointers. The size matters, the location matters, so which part of the bowel the gist is. It matters what they found during the operation. Yeah. Was the gist nicely contained? Or was there a rupture, either before or sometimes indeed during surgery? Because these tumours can be quite friable. And occasionally when the surgeons lift it out, they can rupture. That is a very important bit of information that we need. 
when we review patients. The mutation status is at the moment not in the uh, risk classification, but it defines what happens later, and therefore I've left that in there. If patients are treated before the surgery, then this risk stratification becomes impossible because the bit that I haven't mentioned yet is the mitotic count, i.e. the number of cells that are dividing, changes when you give treatment up front. So occasionally I go back to the pathologist and say, do you remember that biopsy we did a while back? Can you look at that again and tell me how many cells you can see that are dividing to give me a bit of an idea of the risk that the patients face after surgery? <coughs> Metanin was the first who classified the risk. And what he did is he looked at where is it? Is it in the stomach, part of the small bowel, or the rectum? He then looked at the size, and he looked at how many cells over a certain area are dividing. And he identified a cutoff, and he said, if you have um, more than five cells that, that, that uh, you can see in this area that, div that are dividing, this indicates that the gist is more aggressive. So these patients are automatically in the higher risk group, and if it's five or less, they are in the lower risk group. Now that seemed to work quite well, but of course, what do you do with a patient who's got five, you know? Five cells that are dividing? Sometimes you just wonder, well, if the pathologist had looked that little bit closer, or had just looked at slightly different areas, then maybe that would change the, the outcome of, of, this, uh, of this table. And it can move patients from a moderate risk, for example, here. So stomach, over 10 centimetres, but not very, divide, very many dividing, uh, dividing cells. You've got a moderate risk, but suddenly it becomes a high risk gist. And the high risk is 86% of patients have a relapse later on. So it is, it is used. I personally don't like it. Unfortunately, and I'll come back to that in a minute, NICE have used this. Just to show you that it matters, if you just look at size and you look at outcome, and this is from the original uh, publication, if it is more than 10 centimetres, then the risk of it coming back and the, the risk of not surviving becomes very high indeed. Now the next slide is a little bit confusing. Okay. But this is the actual table I much prefer. Because what it does is um, it groups the location of the gist together. So you've got stomach, you have got non-stomach, and I'm not going to talk about the other ones at the moment. You have got size again at the bottom. And then instead of having a cutoff in number of cells that divide, it is, again, a variable. So I sit there very carefully, and I think this patient has a gist in their stomach. Uh, they had no rupture. It was 15 centimeters, and I can now go up here and identify how many cells were dividing and it gives me a much better feel for the risk for the patient. So why does that matter? Well, it matters because maybe there's something we can do to reduce the risk of this just coming back. This is a slide that is a general oncology slide. If you have a malignancy resected, then that doesn't automatically mean you're cured. The question is, is can you increase the cure rate 
by giving a further treatment. And very often with cancers, we use radiotherapy, we use chemotherapy. And the idea is, is that if there are cells that have escaped before the surgeon has been able to cut them out, that we can treat them and we can kill them. That only works if we have an effective treatment available. Now, if you look at patients with GIST that have it cut out, about 50%, it will come back. And your risk changes depending on the risk stratification that we discussed before. The recurrence usually occurs within the first two years. The recurrence is more likely if the gist hasn't been cut out completely and the surgeons can't go back, or if the gist has ruptured either before or during surgery. Now, you know all of this. Yes, of course, we have an effective treatment for gist, a very effective treatment for gist. We've got imatinib, also known as Gleevec. Imatinib was developed not for gist at all. Imatinib was developed for a leukemia. But what they found is that this drug interacts with the C-kit receptor, the one that we've discussed at the beginning and the one that looks a little bit like this. Receptors sit on cells with open arms and they say, feed me. And if you feed the receptor, the cell grows. So you can either stop the feeding of the receptor, which is not always easy, or you can try and block the receptor further down. And that is exactly what imatinib does. And with absolutely amazing results. A PET CT scan is a CT scan that shows you activity as well as location. And I'll show you the image of a PET CT scan in a minute. But the PET CT scan uses radioactive sugars, and the sugars are used to promote cancer malignancy activity, and therefore the uptake is high. And you can switch that uptake off within 24 hours of starting imatinib in some patients. Imatinib can rescue patients who have very, very advanced disease. And I have had patients who've had a heart attack because they've bled so much that they were so anemic that the heart couldn't cope. And the surgeon said to the patient, there's nothing I can do. I might give that Dr. Hennig a ring. He's got an interest in gists. And we've saved the patients, and they've done really well. Andimatinib is effective in about 85% of patients as well. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So what does imatinib actually do? In a normal receptor, there is an activity center. And if that is activated, then you have what we call downstream messengers that tell the cells to grow. And in many gists, this is mutated and it is therefore constantly on. It's like if you constantly eat, you will get bigger. And that's what the gists do, until you block them. And suddenly, all the downstream activity is switched off, and the cells stop growing. So this is a PET CT scan. You can see on the left, you've got a mass here that is very, we call that hot or avid. It's got a lot of uptake. A patient starts on imatinib, and you can see all that uptake is gone. Those cells are not active anymore. They're not hungry anymore. They're not fed anymore. There is one little problem here. Can you see what's happening? It got bigger. And I mentioned before, you want people who know about GISTs to do everything. 
to look at the pathology, to do the surgery, to look at the radiology. Because there is something that we call pseudo-progression. And that means the gists are switched off, but it looks on the scans as if they're still growing. And if a radiologist doesn't know about that, then because we don't routinely do PETs, because they're a pain for the patient, they take a long time to, uh, to do, and there's a lot of radiation involved. So if you don't have that information on the right, then the radiologist may come back to you and say, your treatment is not working, this gist is growing. Yeah. There are some tricks that we can use um, to tell the radiologist, well, actually, we don't think you're right. But it's much easier to have a radiologist who knows this anyway, and who tells you, don't worry about that bit of growth. We've looked at that, and it's not relevant. Your treatment is working. So, imatinib is effective but does it prevent the gist coming back once it's been cut out? I'm going to bore you a little bit now with trial data. The Z9001 trial was done in the States. It was what we call a multi-center trial, so there were several centers that uh, took part in it. It was randomized and double-blind, which means that patients didn't know which treatment they were given, whether it was a dummy tablet or imatinib. Neither did the doctors, and it was randomly allocated. So a computer decided this patient has a dummy tablet, this patient has um, the active drug. When they did the trial, they shot themselves a little bit in the foot because of the trial design. And I'll come back to that in a minute, but it was what we call a crossover design. And for ethical reasons, it was the right thing to do. For trial reasons, it made things very confusing, and it meant that in the UK it took us much longer to get imatinib funded for patients where the gist had been resected and who were at high risk of it coming back. They looked at two endpoints. One was recurrence-free survival, so this is patients who survive and there is no evidence of the gist coming back. But they also looked at something called overall survival, and that is patients are randomized, and the question is, how long do they live from randomization? So if you look at the two graphs, the first one is patients on imatinib who have a longer recurrence-free survival. So it takes longer, they live longer, possibly, but actually they live longer without the gist coming back. But if you look at the graphs, you just wonder whether it just moves the curve to the right. So you treat patients for a year, and then does that just mean you've delayed things by a year, and the gist comes back anyway? And indeed, if you look at the overall survival, there is no difference. So are you going to spend a lot of money on patients if they survive just as long? Are you going to give patients side effects if they survive just as long? And based on that trial data, NICE said, no, we're not going to fund this drug. Thankfully, we looked a bit further. And the Scandinavians also did a trial. And instead of giving imatinib for one year, they gave it for three years, and they compared it with imatinib for one year. And you can see again, if you have imatinib for three years, um, the risk of it coming back is pushed out. You do wonder a little bit whether that's all it's doing. Is it just pushing things out? Is it not affecting the overall survival? But if you actually look at overall survival, you can see that the curves suddenly start to split. So imatinib does rescue patients, yeah, and it cures some patients who would otherwise not have been cured just with surgery alone. 
but there are quite a few questions that still remain. And one of the biggest questions is what happens with different mutations? And I'll come back to that in a, in a, in a short while. What about patients who have got what we call resistant mutations? So we now know more about the mutations. And I'm going to ad-lib here a little bit, because I hope that Philippe Tanier would do all of this. Um, but there are some mutations that we know predict that imatinib is not going to work. So if you know that imatinib is not going to work, are you going to give this treatment to a patient where the gist has been cut out? I think that is nonsensical, and I don't offer that to my patients. There are some mutations, and I'll show you a slide a little bit later on, that make imatinib more likely to work. So those patients, of course, they should have imatinib. But there are some mutations where the imatinib is not quite as likely to work or not quite as likely to work for as long. And there is some evidence that if you give a higher dose of imatinib, you can overcome that resistance. So should these patients have higher doses of imatinib? And these are all questions that at the moment aren't answered yet. And the other question is, is which patients are most likely to benefit? Should you give imatinib to patients who have a very low risk of the gist coming back? Well, probably not, because the risk is low, and it's a long treatment, and it does have side effects. Does it only really delay recurrence? Well, I think the Scandinavian trial has now shown that you can rescue some patients. So no, it doesn't just delay recurrence. But there are still some people who think if we let the data mature and we look in another 10 or 20 years, maybe the overall survival won't be different. And then finally, and this I think is a real question, is if you give imatinib early on, and you give it for three years, and then the patient relapses some time after that, is the risk of the patient not responding to the imatinib any more higher? So are you then taking away an effective treatment from patients where the gist, unfortunately, does come back? Now, NICE have decreed that imatinib should be funded for patients where the gist has a high risk of coming back after resection. They stipulate that it needs to be fully resected, of course, and they also stipulate that it needs to be a CKIT positive gist. That makes it difficult for some patients. They do not mention at all the mutation status because there isn't much data. They only fund it for patients at high risk of recurrence and based on the metinin criteria, which was the first table I showed you. I occasionally sneak a patient in if, based on the UN zoo criteria, they're high risk. Patients with very low risk, low risk or moderate risk, don't have funding for adjuvant imatinib, and they are followed up, and then they need to be followed up carefully. Now, we've talked a bit about these mutations. And the mutations, if you remember, are on that receptor that says, feed me, feed me. And there are sensitizing mutations, and there are resistant mutations. And the resistance mutations, what that means is this receptor is not going to respond to the blockage with imatinib. So how often do we see these mutations? The most common mutation is the so-called exon 11 mutation. It occurs in about 67% of patients. Thankfully, this is the mutation that is most sensitive to imatinib. You then have the rarer mutations. The next, co the next commonest is the exon 9 mutation, and that is a little less sensitive to imatinib. Does it, does, do they matter? 
I'm now going away from the patients who have resected GIST to patients who have advanced GIST, so it's spread to other organs. And in the trial that established imatinib, or one of the trials that established imatinib, your survival depended quite significantly on which mutation you had. So yes, it does matter, and it matters quite a lot. And these are difficult discussions sometimes to have with patients. Because if you have your gist cut out and you have an X or 9 mutation, are you just putting yourself through a bit of heartache and side effects for something that perhaps isn't going to work as brilliantly as if you had an X or 11 mutation? And it takes a lot of time to discuss that carefully with patients. And if you have no mutation, now what does no mutation mean? Well, no mutation probably means that we haven't found the mutation yet that um, is important in this patient. Yeah. But we know that imatinib does not work terribly well in patients where we have an unidentified mutation. So when you have the gist cut out and you go to the surgeon or to the oncologist, the questions that are important are, has it been completely cut out? Because if it hasn't, what are you going to do about it? What is the risk of it coming back? And there we consider the different risk uh, classifications. What mutation have I got? And there are still some centers that don't routinely test uh, for mutations. If I do have a high risk gist and I do go on treatment, what side effects am I likely to have? And if my gist doesn't qualify for treatment now, how will I be followed up and who follows me up? And is there any protocol that, I'm, you know, that I can be made aware of as how the follow-up should happen? Once the gist has spread, quite often it changes from a potentially curable to an incurable situation. Indeed, before imatinib was discovered or made, the survival of patients with GIST was very poor. If you had disease that had spread beyond what the surgeon could cut out, on average, you had 19 months life expectancy. If it had gone to the liver already, that could be even less than that. If you could cut it out and it was localized, you had a 60-month average life expectancy. And that is because, in, as we discussed before, a fair number of patients, the gist would come back within one or two years. And if it did come back, then that would drop your life expectancy to 12 months. Chemotherapy didn't work. The trial that then established imatinib changed all of that. And the most important figure is here. If you have gist that has spread, on average, your life expectancy increased from 19 months to 57 months. I still have patients on imatinib that come to my clinic that were on that first trial that have been on imatinib now for nine, ten more years. So it is, in some patients, an excellent drug. 82% of patients benefit from imatinib, and it is generally quite well tolerated. There is no trial of imatinib against another treatment because at the time when they developed the trial for imatinib, they felt it was unethical to do so. So they used two different doses of imatinib, and you can see there's no difference, really, between the two doses that they used. And at the time, they didn't know about the mutations, and they didn't look for the mutations. So how can you tell that something really revolutionizes a, tr a, a treatment of a certain condition? Well, you can look back you can look back, and the EORTC, the European Organization for uh, the Treatment of Cancers, uh, 
um, for the research and the treatment of cancers. They have got a huge database. So they went back to their huge database and they looked for patients who had either been diagnosed with GIST or had been misdiagnosed but actually had a GIST. And they plotted their survival and then they compared it with the trial data. Now you always have to use these data with a bit of caution but I think you will agree that this is a massive difference. And that's why Gleevec, Imatinib, got through a lot of regulatory hurdles quite quickly. This is a patient of mine with a metastatic gist, so the gist has spread to the liver, and you've got the bottom end of the stomach in there. And you can see that this has shrunk considerably, and in the liver it doesn't seem to have done that much. But actually, if you look very carefully and you play around with the images a little bit and you measure the density of the liver lesions, I don't know if you can see, it's a little bit darker. And that is a, an obvious sign of a response, and we know that now. At the beginning, we weren't quite so sure, but... Um, the radiologists can now be very helpful in determining who is responding and who isn't. So once the gist has spread, the questions are again, where is it and how far has it spread? The question is, what mutation has my gist got? Because that tells me how long my treatment is going to work. I want to know what side effects I'm likely to have because I need to make a decision whether or not I want this treatment at all. And I think another very important question is, are there any clinical trials for me? Because yes, it is good treatment, but it doesn't work for everyone. And for those where it doesn't work, is there something that might be better? Once you are on treatment, of course, you want to know, does it actually work? So it's very important that when you have had a scan, that you discuss that very carefully. Side effects of imatinib tend to be quite mild, although they can vary. Diarrhea is probably the most common one, and rash. But you can get swelling around the eyes, around the ankles. Headaches and fatigue are quite common. You can get, have high blood sugars. You can have changes in the salts in the blood. When you start imatinib, Patients can bleed if the primary gist hasn't been cut out. And they can have torrential bleeding, so you have to be very careful and you have to warn patients about that. Some patients experience nausea, loss of appetite. In the original trial, this wasn't quite so clear, but I see a lot of muscle cramps. Patients who get up in the middle of the night and say, oh, I've had these awful cramps. And you can get joint pains. And over the last five years, we've learned that there are some heart rhythm disturbances that can occur as well. So occasionally doing an ECG is not a bad idea. Some patients respond initially to imatinib, but they develop resistance quite quickly. And that is a way a lot of cancers work. They, they are treated, but they find a way around the treatment and they usually have a second uh, mutation. In about 14%, that can occur early. In about half of patients, the resistance occurs um, within two years. And about 5% of patients can't tolerate imatinib at all. What is very interesting is if you have been on imatinib for about three years, the chances of it working for a long time is much higher. So if imatinib fails, what next? There is um, sunitinib, and this is um, a, another trial that showed patients who either couldn't tolerate imatinib or where imatinib failed and were started on sunitinib. It delayed the growth of the gist. If you remember the numbers, 
and the months that imatinib added to good quality life of patients. So nitinib, we're talking more about weeks than necessarily months. But you can have amazing responses. Now there is some suggestion that the mutation matters in terms of who will respond to the second line treatment. And whereas exon 11 mutations seem to predict that imatinib would, would work really well, the sunitinib is probably not so good to have an exon 11 mutation. And the wild type and the exon 9 mutated patients seem to benefit more. Well, that's not always true. Let me show you another patient of mine with an exon 11 mutation where imatinib failed. And can you see this massive, massive disc that she developed? Indeed, it was in the abdominal wall. It was in, um, outside of the bowel in what we call the peritoneum. She had big, big lesions. And I put her on um, sunitinib. And within three months, all of that had disappeared. And the abdominal wall lesion was tiny. And the peritoneal lesion where you can hardly see that, and indeed you're not quite sure, is that a bit of bowel or is that residual gist? So patients can respond, and can respond really, really nicely. So if imatinib has failed, and I have gist in me, again, I want to know where is it, and indeed quite often I want to know, well, why can't it be cut out? And there are some patients where we can cut it out. Indeed, when I have patients on imatinib and the CT uh, uh, shows that there is one or two areas where the gist is growing, but I know there were more when we started, then I get a PET scan. And if the PET scan shows there is only one or two areas where the gist is growing, but the imatinib is controlling everything else, then I will go back to the surgeons and I will say, can you cut that out for me? And if they say yes, then I ask them to cut it out. And I keep the patient on imatinib because it is still working. And there's no, no need to change a treatment that's active for a treatment that's going to likely work a little less well. Again, it is important what mutation the GIST has. It is important to know about side effects. And again, always ask about clinical trials. And if you're on treatment, you want to know how well it's working. Unfortunately, sunitinib isn't as well tolerated as imatinib. Patients can have diarrhea, nausea, it can cause a sore mouth, or taste changes, which can be really difficult to deal with. It can cause something called the hand-foot syndrome, and patients have described to me, it's like walking on glass. It can cause abdominal pain, it can cause a yellow tinge to the skin. And um, patients sometimes come and say, am I jaundiced? Is it affecting my liver? And if you don't know about sunitinib, then I have had junior doctors say, oh dear, this doesn't look very good at all. And then they come and talk to me and we say, well, actually, it's probably not jaundice. Headaches are common. It can affect the liver. It can cause problems with the thyroid. Again, aches and pains are not uncommon. It can cause bleeding, especially if patients need surgery. It takes a while for the uh, wounds to heal. It can affect appetite and weight, and it can cause high blood pressures that sometimes can be really quite difficult to manage. And what if sunitinib fails as well? Well, this is the last trial I'm going to show you. The next drug is rigorafenib. And that again showed, and this is months again, that if you start patients on rig rigorafenib, you can delay the gist growing by a number of months. And you can improve the survival a little bit. Rigorafenib, 
seems to be a bit better tolerated in many patients than sunitinib. So the question is, should we use it earlier? Should we use it in second line? But the answer to that isn't really established yet. So if you are approaching third line treatment, again, you want to know where there is the disease, what are the side effects, are there any trials? And if you are on rigorafenib, you want to know, is it working? And the side effects of rigorafenib are less well described because we haven't been using it so long. But their high blood pressure is a problem. Hand foot syndrome can be a problem, although I've not seen that yet with any of my patients. It can change the salts in the blood and it can cause other biochemical disturbances. Rash can happen, fatigue, diarrhea, and there is an increased risk of blood clots, so you have to warn patients about that. There are other drugs that are used in GIST. Mazatinib, I'll come back to in a uh, second. Nilotinib has been shown that it works for some very specific mutations that you can identify. Pazopinib, zorafenib, and azatinib. And you can see the nib gives it away. These are all drugs that are similar in mechanism to imatinib. They're called tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And because we can't say that all the time either, we just simply call them TKIs and they act in slightly different ways on the receptor. These are my last couple of slides. There are, at the moment, not many trials open for GIST patients. The first-line trial is mazatinib versus imatinib, and the question is, is something better than imatinib? And that is already open in some centres in the UK. The second line trial, as far as I'm aware, is not yet open, and that looks at whether mesatinib is better than sunitinib in the second line setting, so that is after uh, imatinib failure. And then quite often there are some early phase trials. They usually open at the Marsden. Occasionally you have one open in Leeds, um, Manchester, very occasionally in Leicester. Elsewhere, there are quite a few trials. There is some interest in the genetics of GIST, and especially patients who have either two separate GISTs or a GIST and another type of cancer. Professor Mayer in uh, Cambridge is quite interested in that. There are, in the States, bio, uh, biomarker studies um, where they're looking um, for risk factors um, in patients who are on treatment for GIST. And then there are a whole host of new drugs that are coming through, either alone, and again, these are mainly tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or in combination with these new immune therapy drugs that you may have heard about, because they have revolutionized other cancer treatments, such as melanoma, kidney cancer, and now increasingly lung cancer. These are all early phase trials. So that means they are either looking at, is it safe to give these drugs? Or we know it's safe to give these drugs, but do they actually work? And I'd like to stop there. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, even though I have been involved with GIST for a long time, that was very informative for me, and I, I think everybody else say the same thing. Um, you're happy to take some questions, which is great. Before you do, let me just relate some of what Dr. Hennig has just said to what GIST Support UK have done. Uh, he talked a bit about um, NICE now accepting imatinib for the adjuvant setting when your gist has been removed but you are at high risk of it coming back. As part of their, what they call uh, technology appraisal, that's what they go through in order to, to decide 
yes, we will now allow this drug to be used by people like Dr. Hennig to prescribe to people in, the, in those situations. They asked GIST Support UK, and I went along to that appraisal in Manchester and gave evidence as what they call an expert patient witness. So GIST Support UK were asked to provide evidence to them from a patient perspective as to why NICE should put that drug on their NHS list to be accepted. And it was myself and another, uh, at the time, trustee of GIST Support UK, and we felt that what we had to say, we, we researched all this beforehand, so we went prepared, had a very large impact on their decision making. Um, it was an enlightening experience because they spent a lot of time talking about cost-benefit analysis, which I'm a patient, I'm on, or I was on adjuvant imatinib at that time, and I was listening to 30 experts talking about how much is it going to cost and are we going to get some cost-benefit analysis. And that was very difficult to listen to, but I sort of turned it round and said to them, now that you've finished talking about cost-benefit analysis, can I tell you how I feel? And the chair actually stopped the meeting at that point and said, we need to consider the fact that we have somebody in the room that's on this drug and we shouldn't be talking to him about whether or not we should put this drug based on whether or not it's going to cost the right amount of money for him to live. Uh, you know, so they sort of recognise that they shouldn't be saying those sorts of things, and I think that had a bit of an impact as to whether or not they would approve it. In other words, it focused their mind that we're dealing with real human beings here. So I just wanted to make a link for you guys to understand what we do is just support UK. It's not just to support you, you know, with going through your journey of cancer. It also is a lot of stuff behind the scenes trying to get things like these drugs put onto the NHS list. So I'm going to hand you over to Judith now because she is really good and really experienced at drawing questions out of you guys that are going to make him think about how to answer. So I'll hand you over to Judith. Um, just to add to what Nick has just said, um, when we were trying to get sunitinib approved, I was on that nice appraisal committee too. So uh, we at Just Support UK do have an influence on <coughs> the powers that be, and I think we really have made a difference. And of course, in getting ragorafenib approved by the Cancer Drugs Fund, um, that's still a bit <coughs> questionable for the long-term future, but for the moment, we can get ragorafenib. Um, and as you saw from the statistics, it looks um, in, you know, very encouraging and the data is coming out now that it's perhaps easier to tolerate than sunitinib. Um, I have a question. Um, <coughs> looking at your overall survival data for adjuvant use of imatinib, the, the o difference in overall survival doesn't look very much. And I know when I looked at that data, because I could be on adjuvant imatinib, and I decided not to, because I looked at those statistics and thought, well, I'm 75. Is it really going to make much difference? Or do I pre prefer to have the last few years of my life without the side effects? And if it comes back, well, I'll take it. And I decided not to have the side effects. But I think this was a discussion that I had with my oncologist and the surgeon after my removal of half my liver. Um, I decided, actually, I'd rather have a better quality of life, even if it was marginally shorter. And I think that's important that we have that relationship with the doctors so that we can have an intelligent discussion with them so that we can make a decision which is fully informed. Does that make sense? That makes yeah. perfect sense. Yeah. And, and indeed it is very important to have these discussions carefully mm. and the more information we get, the more informed the discussions can be. You're right. And indeed a lot of patients come to me and say yes about the side effects. I don't want these side effects. And I often then throw patients 
questions back and I say, well, what do you want to get out of this? What is most important to you? Is it to have a quality period now mm -hmm. where you don't have treatment-related side effects? Or is your situation different and you want to extend your life for as much as possible and you are prepared to accept some side effects? And of course, there's then always the middle ground. Well, we can start in Matanib, and if you don't like it, no one's going to force you to take it, and you can come back to me and say, actually, thank you, but no thanks. Mm -hmm. And I will, of course, accept that, because I don't have to take the tablet, <laughs> the patient does, and therefore it is the patient who should remain, should always remain in the driving seat and should make these decisions. I will help and have a discussion and we can talk about the uh, mutations and we can talk about the risk factors, etc. But it just remains the patient's decision on whether or not to go ahead with it. I suppose a secondary question to that is, and I don't think there's any research being done, um, suppose I only took 300 milligrams a day. Does that have a preventative effect? We simply don't know. We know the side effects are less but we don't know whether it works to prevent recurrence. Nobody's done any research, so a lot of questions. Right, I'm hogging the microphone. Any other questions? I'm sure there are lots. If you could raise your hand, and we'll bring a microphone over to you. Yes, it's, uh, <coughs> you, you, you touched, you mentioned about uh, the importance of mutation analysis. Um, I've had just so long now, I can't remember when I was told what my mutation was. I can remember I was told it was um, <coughs> Xon 11. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, what I would like to know more about is how it's actually done and at what stage is the best stage to do it. Okay. Um. I don't think there is a straightforward answer to that. I, I like to know the mutation as early as possible. I don't see all patients who are diagnosed with GIST even in my own hospital, because some just have the surgery, and the surgeons know this is a very low risk, this is probably not going to come back, they don't need to see Dr. Hennig, and I'm not interested in the mutation. What we don't really know yet is how the mutation impacts on the low risk and the, the very low risk patients in terms of, you know, is there a difference in risk even in these patients? And if you have a wild type mm -hmm. mutation, does that increase your risk or lower your risk or does that play no role at all? My mother always taught me that the more information you have, the better decisions you can make. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when patients do come to me, I always give my pathologist a nudge and I say, look, send this to Philip Tanier in, in Birmingham because I do want to know. Mm -hmm. And the earlier you know, the more informed your discussion can be with the patient. And these mutations take a little bit of time to come back. You don't send it away today and you have the result tomorrow, it can sometimes take a number of weeks. So occasionally, I sit in clinic and think, I wish I knew what this mutation is. Because especially if you've got a resistance mutation and you don't want to give a matinib at all, and you have to have this discussion with the patient, you know, there is this drug, but in your case, I don't know if it's going to work or not, or how well it's going to work, because I don't know what your mutation is, makes the discussion very difficult sometimes. So it's much better to get it early on, and then if you don't need it, well, you've wasted 150 quid. But if you do need it, then it can be very, very helpful in the discussion. So my preference would be as early as possible, and indeed sometimes when we do the biopsy long before we do anything else, I give my pathologist a nudge and say, this would be a good one to send to Birmingham. Did you want to ask a question? Sure. The methodology 
the method is to do uh, some sort of biopsy yes. on the tumour yes. to do that. It is always based on the tissue, that you, the first tissue that you have, or the definitive tissue. Okay. What Thank I haven't you. mentioned yep. <laughs> is that it then later on gets very, very complicated because the GISTs develop lots more different mutations. And within a GIST, no matter how big or small, you can have three, four, five different mutations. And I have patients who've got a resistant mutation in one bit of the GIST <coughs> and a sensitizing mutation in another bit of the GIST. And what do you tell the patient? I don't know. And so I tell the patient, I don't know. I suppose this would be a good justification for these trials where you're alternating different drugs. And you may find, I mean, the patient probably couldn't tolerate the side effects of two at the same time. But if you alternate them, sort of three weeks on one, three weeks on another or whatever, then you're hitting some of the tumour some of the time. And hopefully yeah. it, the combination would work. Right. Anybody else? There were lots of hands up originally. I think um, Ivo did answer in his... I haven't said it. Yeah, that was the question you answered it. So. Um, if nobody else can ask a question, oh, there it is. Hang on a second. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask a question about um, once the drugs stop working. Um, I'm on regorafenib, and they thought it would stop working. But interestingly, my last scan has shown it may still be working. But they're starting to talk about something called silver bullets, CERT. And I just wondered if you've got any experience of that being used in GIST? Uh, not, in, not in GIST. Uh, we use CERT in Nottingham for the standard uh, bowel cancer uh, metastases that have gone to the liver. I think it is always worthwhile if patients are on a tyrosine kinase inhibitor and it stops working to think very hard about does it stop working generally or is it one area where it stops working? And if it is just one area, is there something that we can do to that one area? And especially if it's in the liver, there are a number of things that can be done now, not all of them funded, um, where you think, if I could just target that bit, then I can give that drug for that little bit longer and I can eke out the time that patients can be on it. Um, CERT certainly seems to be working in some patients with the standard bowel cancer, colorectal cancer, and they, we've seen some very, very nice uh, results. We, I think, would have probably issues with funding because it's not routinely funded for GIST, and I think it would need to go through the whole process. And the Cancer Drugs Fund, um, which is coming to an end, of course, at the end of this month, and where there's still lots of discussion going on about how this is going to be replaced. The Cancer Drugs Fund, when asked about CERT in bowel, standard bowel cancer, said it's not a drug, it's radiotherapy. So they wouldn't touch it, and there were huge discussions going on about it. Um, I think these are very very difficult areas that need to be discussed between you and the oncologist very, very carefully. And if there is a way to find some funding, why not try it? But you need to be sure that the regorafenib really isn't working, because if it's still working in other areas and there's just this one bit that's causing a problem, well, there is RFA. There is a saber, which some people can use, which is radiotherapy, extra, sort of with the normal radiotherapy machines, but that can be very, very localized. And sometimes you can get into a local research program, they call it, where the radiotherapists say, we've got this new method, we want to have a bit more experience before we roll it out, we're looking for people who would like to take part in this. And, uh, and sometimes you can squeeze in in, in, in other ways. I know of a lady who was on imatinib, does not see um, a specialist in GIST. Um, I took it for three years, uh, non-stop. She has been put on it, taken off it, 
purely because she was going on holiday and she wanted to be able to taste the food, etc. Is that advisable? Um, there was a very interesting French trial um, where they allocated patients to either continuous imatinib or imatinib with breaks in it, with holidays in it. And I think the data was very clear that continuous imatinib was better in terms of survival. If you have got an incurable gist, then quality of life matters possibly more mm -hmm. than quantity, and therefore it is an individual decision that you have with the patient about if they want to have treatment breaks. We've now got some data to say to the patient, well, actually, if you have long treatment breaks and you go back on the imatinib, it may not work as well. Um, if you have short treatment breaks, I think no one knows how many short treatment breaks you can have, and, and so that there is still uncertainty there. But um, certainly, if you go somewhere nice and imatinib affects your taste, and you know that you're going to a five-star, you know, restaurant, then yes, come off the imatinib until your, you know, taste buds have recovered. Enjoy that and then go back on it again later. Hi, um, it's, you all sound very knowledgeable on your subject. We come here quite blind. You've mentioned in your talk myotic counts, exon 9s and 11s. We've not had that information from the oncologist. Should we be asking or do we assume because this isn't forthcoming that oncologist isn't proficient enough in GIST? <laughs> um, I think the question is to the oncologist do you think the mutation matters in my case yeah. and if they start waffling <laughs> then they're probably not very knowledgeable and then what would you do um, I would ask I would look on the GIST UK Second website opinion. and I'd get some advice from, uh, from the patient reps and I would ask to see someone who knows what they're talking about. Very <laughs> diplomatic. <laughs> I think the one lesson that we should all learn from this talk is you need an expert in GIST to look at your histopathology to make sure that you're on the right treatment path and, you know, asking those questions, as Dr. Henniger just said, you're not doubting the ability of your um, medical profession. You're simply making sure that with this very rare cancer, you're speaking to the right people. And you can always be referred to an expert centre. Yeah, they, they, if, if you ask, if you are unsure as to the proficiency from a GIST perspective, of your medical professional, then you, yes, absolutely can ask to be transferred to uh, a, a, an expert centre uh, for a second opinion. And GIST Sport UK can help you do that. And I would like to just make it absolutely clear that I too think there are people who know a lot more about GIST than I do. And I go to them and ask. Yeah. It's always, always helpful to have a second opinion. And I know sometimes people feel, well, if I ask for a second opinion, does my oncologist think I don't trust them? And you may or may not trust your oncologist, but an oncologist who's worth their money will think, well, if someone goes for a second opinion, what's the worst thing that can happen? The worst thing that can happen is I learn something from someone else that I didn't know before, and that'll benefit all my patients who, are, who, are, who I'm going to see in the future. So I encourage second opinions. I like to send my patients away. And sometimes it's a second opinion that I can get via email. And I, I contact my colleagues and I say, what do you think in this situation? Is there anything that I haven't thought about that you would do? Have you had a patient in a similar situation? And that works really well.
And sometimes I send patients away and I say, actually, you know what? I would like you to see the patient and I would like to, and quite often this is patients who have you know, exhausted all the standard options and I quite often contact the Marsden and say, have you got a trial open that isn't available for me to see on the websites because they're not updated yet or, and indeed sometimes they come back to say, well actually, you know what? Last week we opened this trial, your patient might be ideal for that, send, send them down. And of course that's what we do. Another question, in relation to malignant tumour, which is resected, did I understand it correctly to say that in relation to recurrence, at least 50% of patients uh, had a recurrent disease after primary resection, usually occurs after or within 22 years, was that right? Months. Pun months. 22 months. months. Yeah. So you Fine. Great relief. Uh, I speak as a patient who has been discharged, and therefore I ought to be the happiest person in the room. Uh, it was just there. <laughs> that's fine. Uh, what I would ask is, is, in that reaction, is not having an oncologist anymore. If there were to be any recurrence, or, or if you were concerned there might be, is your old uh, tumour tissue retained? Are your records retained after you've been discharged? Okay. The, uh, I think the legal basis is any malignancy has to be retained for 10 years minimum. And then there are some places that retain them for longer, but after all the um, issues that, I don't know if you remember the Alder Hay um, Pediatric Hospital, where they retain tissue without the, the patients or their um, carers' knowledge. There are now quite strict rules in terms of how long tissues are, are retained. But generally, for a minimum of 10 years, the pathologists keep the block if there is a tissue left. Now, if you've had a resection, of course, there will be quite a bit of tissue left, and that will be retained for a minimum of 10 years. If you just had a tiny biopsy, they might have used all that biopsy up to make the diagnosis and send for the mutational analysis, etc. So there may not be actual tissue left. Your other part of the question was, is that tissue relevant? Yeah. Well, the records that, that now that more and more is going on to electronic records and uh, patients' um, records are being scanned and, and saved electronically, they are kept for forever. Um, some of the old case notes are being destroyed, but quite often they are copied onto microfiche. Mm -hmm. Bit of a problem if you want to read them, um, because um, it's not always that easy, but they should be retained. In terms of how relevant is the histology that you had when you had your resection to if it does come back, in a lot of cancers it is very relevant. In just occasionally, you would then want to know, well, actually, is this a recurrence or is it a new primary? So you probably ought to check that anyway. And if it is a recurrence, it may not have the same mutation that it had when it was original there, originally there. So you might want to get a biopsy or resect it again anyway to do all the tests again that you've done in the, f or, or may, at the time may not have done, actually, to do all the tests that you need to do. Could I come back to this point about progression, please? Um, you mentioned that it was really important um, to establish whether it really was progression in general or just in one area. Um, if you are being monitored and you have a CT scan which suggests that there might be some progression, how do you establish whether it is general or just one place? Or what's the sort of time scale in terms of um, clinical observations to establish that? Um, it can be very variable. <laughs> um, you, it, I, I am very, very lucky because in Nottingham I have got a radiologist who I've worked with very closely and even if a scan is reported by someone else and I, I look at the report and I think, hang on a minute, this is not reported by my favourite radiologist then she knows I'm going to come knocking on her door and I'm going to say, look at that scan, please, for me and just tell me what you think is really going on. Um, 
there are some shortcuts. So occasionally, if there is a real question and it, it would change my management, then I can always get one of these PET CT scans. And that is new-ish, because four or five years ago, I knocked on the radiologist's door and I said, I want a PET scan, and so they said, give me the money, you can have a PET scan. Now, the rules for PETs have been relaxed a little bit, so it's easier to get a PET scan. So, if I'm thinking about, you know, surgery in a patient who's on uh, a triazine kinase inhibitor, or the radiologist comes back and says, well, in this case, you may want to know sooner rather than later whether this is true progression, then a PET scan can be very helpful. Occasionally, a PET scan can be very, very confusing because it, PETs show lots of other things as well that you then need to investigate. So you might put the patient through a lot of tests that they don't really need. And sometimes time is incredibly helpful.